tell you, the viewer, about the man I'm just about to interview, Mr. Phil Collins, that you don't already know. Because it seems to me that it's common knowledge he's one of the biggest and most successful singer-songwriters on the scene today. It seems to me that everyone knows that he's not just a performer, but also a caring and devoted family man. And that when he's not at home with the kids, he's out there performing with one of the great surviving progressive rock bands of the 70s, Genesis. And if that weren't enough, Everyone also knows that in his spare time, he carves out quite a career for himself as a successful screen actor. Well, I've looked long and hard, and here are a few lesser-known Phil Collins facts that I've discovered for your pleasure. For example, Phil Collins is not his real name. He was actually christened and spent most of his life as Blind Lemon Collins, but changed his name so as not to be confused with the famous blues performer, Blind Lemon Jefferson. Another fact about Phil that might surprise you is that in the evening when he's laid down his drumsticks and put the kids to sleep, he just doesn't go and put his feet up like the rest of us. He's out there on the mean streets of Manhattan, fighting crime and making the world a safer place for you and I. And how about this final Phil Collins fact? He's also on the verge of launching his own range of perfume for men, a delicious blend of herbs and flowers that will be sold under the classy but endearing name Phil Poor Om. How about those facts, eh? And this very man, this superhuman achiever, is waiting for me, little old me, right now, on the 39th floor. Phil, first of all, may I say thank you for joining me here on this beautiful, balmy Manhattan evening. <laughs> Isn't it lovely and warm out there? It right? is. And this light, I think <clears throat> we both look very attractive men. I think so. Um, now, the new album is just out both sides. <coughs> True. And, and I was both surprised and a little bit alarmed to see that you not just wrote all of the songs on it, mm. and of course sing all the songs on it, but you produced all the songs on it, and if I'm not mistaken, you play every single instrument on the album. Yeah. Now, so is this just because you're looking for a more personal, thoroughly personal thing, or are you just trying to save money? <laughs> cheap. Cheap by name, cheap by nature. Um, <clears throat> well, no, actually, a couple of reasons, really. Once the songs started coming, uh, coming out, they were kind of quite personal. And it, it seemed to me that it was a logical conclusion to sort of get to that I could actually be playing everything because it was one man's thoughts, you know. And I'd never done it before, so it was a challenge. I don't play guitar and bass, so I played it on the bass, on the keyboard, you know, like the sampled sounds. So yeah. the real sounds played on the keyboard, and you try to think of how a voicing, how, how a guitar player would play it. Does it sound like a guitar player? Yeah, that does. And so um, it was very easy and really enjoyable. You, you said um, when the song started coming out, which made me, which was not a pleasant image. No, I, said, I realized that as I said it. To be fact. frank, um, so how do, now, how do these songs come out? <laughs> what is the process of coming <laughs> out of the song? Yeah. Uh, well, you kind of, the way it works, you just play and they come out. And uh, you, you play and, and they, they evolve, really, I suppose is, is the word. And some of the time you don't try and do something. You know, I think, I can't try and, and write a song. You, you actually just start playing at the piano or a keyboard and you get, you set up a mood with the drum machine or a sound, an atmosphere with the keyboards now, and you just fool around, you know, and you muck about until something sounds good, and then you start putting that with something else, and how would that sound if you added that to it? So um, it's really uh, something that just develops, and, um, and as this material developed, you actually end up knowing how you want to treat it. So when you're, when you're doing that, when you're playing around initially and you're getting somewhere, do you know there's a stage, do you think, yeah, this is a hit? Like, for example, um, In the Air Tonight, mm -hmm. which is one of your biggest uh, successful songs and also mm -hmm. one of the most atmospheric, the word used a second ago. <clears throat> Did you know at that stage that this was, this was going to be dynamite or do you, do you have no idea? No, that, that song particularly was, one of the, was on the first album and I didn't even know I was making a record at that point. I was just writing songs therapeutically in a way to occupy my time having just been through kind of a, what was to be a sort of divorce but at that time it was just a separation and I was writing these songs as kind of messages if you like to the, um, the ex you know to see if oh, well, she'll understand this well, she'll understand what I'm talking about when she hears this and so in the air tonight was actually um, was just a doodle you know it was, it was a drum machine pattern with a, with a sound and then I sang the words I mean all those words that are on that song are spontaneous <laughs>
go right back because one thing that has always um, uh, I've always enjoyed when I read about you is, of course, your youth as a as a child on the stage. That's right. And it's something because I was in a, I was very briefly in a in a stage school and I once a, an experience that mm -hmm. scarred me psychologically. I was made to dress in pink and green satin once, and I had to sing "I Was Born Under a Wandering Star" using an axe yeah. made out of uh, cardboard and right. foil. Enough of that. You were, <laughs> Please. You, were of course, <laughs> you, you were the artful dodger for. Uh, <coughs> were you artful dodger, or Oliver? I know. I've been the artful dodger for seven months. I, I, my mother was starting to run this agency from home, and she started getting the calls in. Because uh, a friend of hers, Barbara Speak, who ran the stage, the, the ran the dancing school, she wanted to start an agency, and so my mum was doing nothing, so she started running the agency from home. Got a few calls and got one for the Artful Dodger, and I was at grammar school at the time. So I got the call, went down there, and I started, um, I did the audition, and that's always a very levelling, embarrassing situation, because you have like 300 kids all, all willing you to fail, yeah. you know, standing out as you stand up, and you sing your song, and you hand your sheet music to the pianist, and you go, <coughs> consider yourself, <laughs> you know, and everyone's going, get off, you know, behind your back. And so eventually I got recalled and recalled, and I, I got it. I did it for seven months until my voice broke. So yeah. what age are we talking here? What are Fourteen. You? So, uh, and were you happy to be doing this? I mean, this was something that you wanted to do, or was it the case of your mum saying, look, you know, I really want us to get involved in showbiz and, and pushing you forward? No, my mum was the opposite of the, the, sh the pushy showbiz mum, because I think she felt that everybody would think that. And she's always, you know, she actually worked in reverse. She didn't send me for some things that maybe I, I could have got or I could have at least gone for the audition. So I, I didn't do any of that. But really, I've been playing drums since I was five. I had a kit of drums when I was five years old. A little make tin pot kit, but a kit nevertheless. And I taught myself to play the drums, and really that's what I wanted to do. But I couldn't get in a band until I was old enough. around the drums, did I? I had to sort of wait for Peter Gabriel to leave, to leave Genesis before I sort of... I mean, that whole thing, I mean, you know, a lot of people in the past have said, you pushed him out, didn't you? you, know, you well, you did, you, Phil. You couldn't wait to give it. But Phil, everyone knows. <laughs> I mean, that's not, that's not on the street. Bush. Let's see, you know, he didn't jump, the poor guy. <laughs> he was pushed, wasn't he? Now, I... Um, <laughs> Organised the power base, got him out. <laughs> <laughs> coup. It was a coup. Now, we tried desperately to find another singer. And uh, there was no one that we met or auditioned that we wanted in the family, you know, basically. So um, <clears throat> we were writing this music for Trigger the Tail at the time, and we thought, okay, well, we're going to the studio and see how it goes, you know. And so one by one, I started singing the songs, and then we ended up at the end of the album with still no singer, but I said, okay, I'll have a go, you know, as long as we can get a drummer that I like. Yeah. And I went out front, but it was really uh, against my, my better instinct and, and against my, and my wishes, really, but we just didn't have anybody else. Having got out there, I then um, saw the power that was possible. And uh, the communication of, of you know, people listening to lyrics, and that, that kind of changed my approach um, from having the, the, the conception of the, the singer was the guy that wiggled his bum and appealed to the women, you know. And but the drummer was the real backbone of the band. You said arse earlier instead of ass, I noticed. Oh, no, that. It'll always be arse. <laughs> Bunch of arse! Now, of course, really your solo career, commercially, I think, is, is even more successful than Genesis. Yeah, I suppose it is to some extent. I mean, Genesis' popularity and in, in, in terms of if that is reflected in the amount of albums we sell is, in, is increasing. I think we've left behind some of our older fans as a result of that, and they kind of, they give me a hard time because they think it's my fault, you know. I mean, a lot of the time, because we have hit singles nowadays, it's because I have hit singles as well on my own. It's like, oh, well, Phil's, you know, he's, he's done this, he's ruined the band. And I, I really resent the, 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 the criticism because I, you know, I, get, I, get, I don't get the I don't want the glory or the blame to be quite mm. honest. Well, there is a different sound, but then you, it's 20 years on, so there would be a different mm. sound. I think that's what I that's what I, I say. To them, you know, they really want us to play music that's either influenced by that a lot more or all those very same kind of songs. And and I say to them, you know, like you, you don't read the same books, you don't dress the same, you don't look the same as you did 20 years ago. Yeah. Why should we? You know. 
Let me ask you about um, other, producing other people, because uh, <clears throat> you produced your own album, but you produced Eric Clapton mm -hmm. just a while ago. Now, is it hard when you go into someone who um, is a kind of rock legend in their own right, who is someone who is perhaps one of the biggest rock stars ever, uh, and you've then got to say to him, well, you just hit a bum note, or the vocals are squeaky, or I don't know what you say to Eric in that situation. Well, I, I um, was, a, was a good friend of his for many years before he even asked me, actually. Um, although there was that first moment when you... There was that first moment when you walk in and, and the, he plugs in the guitar and, and you think, now, how, what, how am I going to say this? You know, because, uh, you know, he play, when, when he plays, a lot of what he plays is fantastic. And he's not a bad guitarist. Exactly. That's what I said. Yeah, well, sorry, I, was, <laughs> I wasn't listening to <coughs> I was looking at the sunset. But he's, uh, you know, so it's hard to sort of discern what's good and what's really good and what's fantastic. But, I mean, to be honest, as I knew him, and he asked me because someone had said to him, listen, what we should do on this record is kind of get a bit, bit, of, that, bit of that Phil Collins sound, you know, and he, not knowing that I knew him, that, that he knew me. So uh, he rang me up one day and said, Phil, I want you to come over. Uh, fancy producing the album? So I said, yes. And I, I, it was a lot, it was actually, it was a love thing. It wasn't actually as intimidating as it would have been had he just asked me out of the blue. Let, let me ask about your acting side of your career, <clears> because this is something which is uh, very successful for you, and I know that you've got the ever bigger projects planned, and yet it's something which many rock stars have, have mm. tried to do, few as successful as you. Why do you think that is? I, actually, when I, when I start thinking about it, because you always put the, sort of the major, I mean, the Jaggers and the, the Bowies and the Stings and, and, and me, and, and uh, I mean, there are others like Adam Ant and the Kemps and, uh, oh, yeah. and uh, Tom Waits, Levon Helm. People that actually are great character actors. I love it as well. Yeah. yeah. You know, so, some of them actually, there are more than we think that have done it successfully, or to, to some extent successfully. But I think it's just, uh, in music, you want to cultivate a charisma. You have to cultivate an image, which I have never really done. And I've, you know, it's worked against me because people won't put me on the front cover of their magazines, you know, because I, I'm not effervescent or, or yeah. charismatic enough. Now, when you come to act, that's the last thing you want. So... Whilst that has been detrimental to my musical career, if you like, in as much as Spin Magazine and The Face won't put me on the front, um, it, with acting I can be more of a chameleon and, and people can forget that I am who I am quicker than they can Jagger. Yeah. You know, Jagger, it's like, yeah, is Mick Jagger trying to act? Is he, is he good at it? It's uh, the lips. Yeah. But uh, does that bother you at all that you haven't been like <clears throat> on Spin and Face? Because presumably, you know, you couldn't really be much bigger than you are in terms of uh, music success. I really fail to see that. So uh, it's more on a kind of just a self level. Yeah, yes, there's a, for your own self-satisfaction, it's nice to sort of, to try and, it's like the old thing of, it's the people that don't like me, I'm more interested in knowing why they don't than the people that do, you know? And uh, I, get, I get bothered by it less, and as I'm, you know, 42 now, I kind of have realized that it's too late to worry about all that stuff. I mean, you know, the, 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 the bridges have been burnt as far as that's concerned, and it's only the the odd closet fan that might come out and say, yes, excuse me, I've actually always liked you, although I've slagged you off for years. But, but to be honest, uh, the thing that, that I actually, that picks me up whenever I get a bit brought down by bad reviews and stuff is the fact that the man on the street likes what I do. I relate to the normal person, you know? And that's really what it counts, that's what, you know. Let's go back to acting briefly, because um, I enjoyed you tremendously. Your first star in role, which must have been uh, I thought daunting for you, Buster, mm -hmm. and it was, uh, I thought, a, the, a really nice job you did there, I really enjoyed it, and I didn't feel I was watching Phil Collins rock star, I thought right. I was watching an actor doing a job, mm. but doing it convincingly. Um, but that was a fake beard you wore in that at one stage, yeah. and that was the worst fake beard I've ever seen <laughs> in any film in the history of cinema, and I was curious, when you, when you were doing this, did, were you aware that this was a really bad beard and you were just being polite to the makeup person, or were you fooled, it was a hot place you were filming it in and there were lights and... Didn't get it, well, maybe the trouble is, when it's, when, it's a, when it's a false beard, it doesn't move. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> well, I noticed this. And uh, no, this is one of the flaws of the film. And I watch it back, you know, I, I think, you know, that's no, didn't work. The beard but, didn't work. Everything else yeah, is fine. Well, you know, there, there are. I think with the, you know, with a film like that, it's um, it gave me so many opportunities that I, I am loath to, to to knock any aspect of yeah. it because I actually had a great time doing it, and Julie is wonderful to work with. I worked with a great uh, cast and crew. We all had a great time doing it. We were recreating the 60s, you know. Got ready, Buster. We better go. Boat leaves at midnight. How long? How long will it take? I don't know yet. Maybe six weeks. That bastard steak would have really worked us over good and proper. 
Jimmy was right. I should have been in Switzerland myself handling that cash. I don't know, with a bit of luck in a couple of weeks, I'll have the bank accounts operating and I'll find out what happened to that 20 grand. I'll get the new passports, I'll get the tickets, and then I'll send for you. Buster, come on, it's getting late. They'll go without you if you're not there. Buster, don't go. I'm frightened. I love you so much. Look, listen to me, you old bag. I'll be shut up with you for 24 hours a day, seven days of bleeding week near enough. God, most men would have throttled their old ladies by now. You want to know why I haven't? Because you are the best bloody thing that's ever happened to me. Let's go away from the acting for a and let's go back in broader terms to the music because two of your most famous fans, of course, are the uh, uh, still the best known members of our royal family, I guess, worldwide, Prince Charles mm. and Princess Diana, who for many years it was known they were big fans and they would go to the concerts together. And of course, sadly, they're no longer together. Right. Now, um, which one of them got custody of your albums, do you know? <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I know, we presented the Prince Charles with a box of Genesis albums, with a very nice box, and I think he actually eyed the box and thought, oh, I don't know who's going to have the albums, but I'm having the box, you know? Um, I think he, he, uh, he likes the music. I mean, it's no, it's, he makes no bones about the fact he's more of an opera fan, you know? I mean, like some of the sort of, some of the love songs he enjoys listening to, I think, and Princess Diana, probably the same. I mean, you know, I don't know what they like about what I do. I just, um, I work with Prince Charles and the Princess Trust and I kind of got a lot of time for him. I think he's got, actually, he cares a lot about the young people in, in England and I think that's, uh, that can only be a good thing. Do you feel more, still more at home in England or do you feel more kind of uh, American now? Well, I do find myself lapsing into, I mean, I say garbage at home, you know, sort of rubbish or... But you said arse earlier instead of ass, I noticed. Oh, no, that would it'll always be arse. <laughs> Bunch of ass, like 40, you know. And what about, um, butt. Will, it, will it be ass, trousers, ass. trousers rather than pants? No, it's pants are always going to be pants. Yeah, you? underpants to Under the Englishman, yeah. yeah. Suspenders are always going to be suspenders, you know, as wears. opposed to braces, you know, yeah. which is there, you know. I mean, um, there's all that kind of thing, which I, I, I'm too set in my ways to change that. But I, I do find, um, I mean, people think that I'm American and they think that Jill's English. I think we've actually met, uh, you know, language-wise in the middle. But I, I still find, um, I, I think of myself very much as English, although I have a house now in LA which, which we haven't yet spent a night in because we're still restoring it, you know, and sort of doing it up. And I have more friends in LA probably than I have in England in some respects. But I don't think I'll ever move there. I am far more no normal and ordinary than you would like to be. One thing I noticed while reading about you and when talking about you is that everyone talks about you as an ordinary guy. They say, Phil Collins, the ordinary rock star. Mm -hmm. Phil Collins, the average guy. And I was thinking, if this was me, I'd be really annoyed about this because here I am, Phil Collins, international global megastar, uh, has been a success in just about everything I've turned my hand to. I am not an ordinary guy. People keep saying to me, when you, um, you know, you're a rock star, how do you know what it's like? How can you sing about the homeless? How can you sing about this? You know, you live in a cosseted world. At that point, I say, listen, you know, I am far more no normal and ordinary than you would like to believe. I don't work at this, and what you see is what you get. I'm, I'm, I'm a normal person because I was brought up normal, you know, and I, I choose not to divorce myself and, and uh, separate myself from real life. So you've got the new album out, which is going to be no doubt as hugely successful as all the previous ones. Um, Maybe, yeah. And the band played on is very moving and very well received drama about the AIDS crisis when it first broke here in America. So what is the next, the immediate next step in your in your kind of career <coughs> plan, if indeed you have one? For me, the future is a tour next year. And a world tour, or just a yeah, we're going everywhere, pretty much everywhere. We're arranging it around, around the school holidays, uh, so as to try and keep you know family involved and. Um, 
After that, I don't know, you know, I'd love to, I, I need to do some more acting, because I, I, I actually said this year that I would be giving the whole of this year dedicating it to acting and trying to get some parts. And, and what happened was, while I was waiting, I, I ended up writing these songs, and then I got involved in an album, and I actually ended, ended up having to pass on a couple of parts that I really wanted to do. So, so uh, after the tour, I'm going to get stuck into that. And who knows after that? And, and if the acting took off uh, and you were more successful or more satisfied by doing that than, than performing as a singer and, and with a band, what would you miss about that side of your life if you decided to go the acting route? Well, I never would, totally, until such point as, um, you know, that I would, I mean, about ten years' time when maybe me standing on stage would look a little comical. So yeah. ten years is your cut-off point, you suspect, for... Uh... No, no, I was just an arbitrary figure that came out of the head, but I, I just think that, I mean, I never, I do, I sit at a piano and I stand up and, and sing the songs, you know, so that I can basically go on that, doing that until I feel like I, I want to stop. But as acting, I can do until I drop. So, but I don't, I don't think there's going to be a time when I'm going to have to choose between one or the other. Phil, it was a great pleasure speaking to you this evening. Was it really? It was. As you can see, we've uh, spent the better part of a day now. It's now, it's now fully dark outside. Time for <laughs> both of us to don our costumes and hit the streets and fight crime. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to the bat poles. <laughs> They gave me a pair of women's tights to wear, <laughs> and uh, that was actually it was so you know it was sort of the line of it. it was horrible. And uh, well, that would do far more damage to your career. That's right. Than leaving out of bed with a pair of ladies' and, tights. Uh, and as I got out of bed, Julie was like <laughs> you know, laughing anyway. So it was kind of, sort of magical at the moment.